Um, so I'm going to stop talking now and uh, join me in welcoming Mark Lebo. Thank you. Uh, it's a very uh, wonderful pleasure to be here. Um, as I always like to point out, um, I'm English. I was born in Ferrum. Um, and but it's complicated because I, you know, I have four identities available to me. I was born in England. I grew up in Canada. My mother's Jamaican, and I live in America. And I, what I tend to do is. In each place I'm in, I try to pick the most advantageous identity. So when you're in Jamaica, you want to play up your Canadianness because Jamaicans essentially all want to move to Canada. When you're in Canada, you want to play up your uh, your, Jama your Jamaicanness because Canadians think that's very exotic. When you're <laughs> in America, you want to play up your uh, your Englishness because Americans are, in, of course, in the thrall of the English. But I never know who I'm supposed to play up when I'm in England. So I, maybe I should play up my Englishness when I'm in England. Anyway, so that's the, well, I was puzzling over which identity I would, I would adopt this evening. And I, I, haven't, I haven't come to a conclusion. Maybe some of you could suggest that when we're finished. Um, I, uh, so I'm here to talk a little bit about this new book that I've written. Um, and uh, it, uh, I don't really have a, you know, I'm supposed to at this point have a very kind of clear linear story about how I came to write it, but I don't. I have a slightly confused one. But I, I think what happened was I was, um, I got very interested in a few years ago in, I'm always interested in spy stories, but I was quite drawn to these, I was reading lots of books about it, spies, and two, two stories of spies. And the thing that's fascinating about spies, of course, is that they're, almost invariably, they're not caught forever, right? They're always in place for 20 years, which doesn't make any sense. You're a spy, you're stealing secrets, giving them to the enemy, and you could apparently do it for longer than most people hold normal, non-traitorous <laughs> jobs, um, which I, has always baffled me, the, the sheer longevity of spies has always been fascinating to me. And I read this amazing story, read, uh, heard about, uh, this amazing story of this uh, defector who was a, had been high in the Cuban intelligence service, and he defects to the West in 1988, I think. And he goes and he demands to see, presents himself at the U U.S. Embassy in Vienna, and he says, I have something, a story to tell you, and he demands an audience with all the top brass at the CIA, and also a guy who used to run the CIA's office in uh, Havana, and he says, I have something to tell you. And he says, you know, this person who is, you think is an American spy in Cuba is actually working for the Cubans. And so is this person and this person. And he lists everyone who, the entire roster of American spies in Cuba, he reveals in that moment. He says, well, actually, they're all working for Fidel Castro. You have been duped not once, not twice, but 26 times by, and the Americans, of course, are mortified, flabbergasted, et cetera, et cetera. And this was the kind of, if you're interested in how do spies get away with their business for so long, this is the kind of er spy story. This is the, this is not one person getting away with everything for so long. This is the entire roster. Everyone is lying to their handlers, and the handlers don't have the slightest suspicion this is going on. Anyway, I thought this was the greatest story of all time, and I spent a huge amount of time, and apparently it had never really been told properly, and so the, went to Miami and it, it's just like there was some shadowy ex-CIA guy who I met in some quasi-secret location and then I tracked down the guy, the other guy who was in the room who was this legendary CIA spy guy from Cuba who was the guy who was deceived and he wouldn't give me his real name and he wouldn't call me from his actual phone number. I mean the whole thing was sort of crazy. But I didn't know what to do with this story because I thought you couldn't write a whole story about it. Um, but I was mulling over this problem of how is it that a spy master could have a, an ongoing conversation with people, with their spies, and be lied to the entire time and not know it, even though they're CIA officers. You'd think they would know when they were being lied to. Um, and then this thing happened that crystallized the book period, which was the, this incident involving this woman named Sandra Bland, 
as some of you may know, there was a wave of these incredibly high profile cases in America between 2014 and 2016, in which, which involved police officers um, engaged in improper conduct with uh, African Americans, mostly African American men. Often they would shoot them under outrageous circumstances. The most famous of these was the Ferguson case, which led to weeks of riots. And, but there was one of those cases which really caught my eye, which involved a woman named Sandra Bland, who was coming from a job interview at a university in Texas. And she drives, it's the middle of the day, she drives out of the campus. A police officer pulls her over for a kind of a non-existent minor traffic infraction. They start a conversation, it goes wrong. They get into a kind of argument. He pulls her out of the car, arrests her, puts her in jail, and she hangs herself three days later. And it was because the the police had a policeman had a video camera on his dashboard, as they often do, the whole thing was recorded and the tape was released. And that and other things, and the sheer kind of stupidity and banality of the incident. Um, made it a big story in America, but it also profoundly affected me. And I became kind of obsessed with that case. And the more I thought about it, the more I realized that it was a version of the same problem that had obsessed me with the spies, which is that two people with kind of differing agendas were having a kind of conversations, and they were completely misunderstanding each other, um, who they were, what they wanted. And I thought, oh, that's what I should write a book about. And so that's what I've done, is to write a book about this phenomenon, which strikes me as a phenomenon that's at the heart of all manner of modern controversies, which is people from uh, people of different perspectives meet each other for the first time and proceed to profoundly misinterpret each other's intentions. Um, and so each chapter of this book is a different case study I talk about Bernie Madoff, the, the most extraordinary Ponzi schemer of all time. That's a, that's a miscommunication problem, right? People meet this guy, give him large sums of money, and completely miss the fact that he's a crook. Um, I have a chapter on uh, Amanda Knox, um, who is another version of the same problem. A young woman, a completely harmless college girl from Seattle does a year abroad in Italy. Her roommate is brutally murdered by a drifter, essentially. And the Italian police and the British tabloid press managed to convince themselves that at the center of the death of this of the death of this young woman is this harmless college girl from Seattle. In retrospect, the most absurd, implausible conclusion imaginable, yet it is sustained for years and years and years books are written on the basis of this, and the young woman spends several years in jail as a result of this uh, grotesque miscarriage of justice. How did they so profoundly mislead, misread Amanda Knox? How is a middle class college girl from Seattle get somehow, is somehow, how is she somehow perceived as someone who delights in engaging in murderous sexual games with complete strangers? Um, uh, I could go on. So each of the chapters is a chapter about what happens when two people uh, encounter each other at a party and both are drunk. What does alcohol mean for the potential for miscommunication? Um, I have a chapter about a, a pedophile um, who's on the loose at a university. And the question is, uh, why do people, why does it take so long to uncover this man's pedophilia? Um, how is it that someone can be routinely abusing young men for years and years and years and not get found out? Um, the, um, so that's the kind of structure of the book, is to look at all of these cases and then ask, are there some fundamental principles that explain this? And then at the end of the book, I come back to the story of Sandra Bland and try and um, reinterpret what happened between her and that man by the side of the road. And the, and the, and the, and the, and the, police officer by the side of the road, in the light of what we've learned from all these other uh, cases. Um, it was a, a, a very fascinating book to write, perhaps um, might have been the most interesting of all of my books to write. Um, all, kind, all manner of strange 
um, moments in the reporting of it, um, and fun things as well. There's a, at one point I was very interested in how is it, how do, is the way that people behave in tele television sitcoms different from the way people behave in real life? So I took a episode of Friends and employed a, a psychologist trained in a very specific way of reading human expressions um, and made her analyze a crucial scene in one of a, in a Friends episode and we compared it to real life. That was an incredibly kind of fascinating. Uh, another time I realized that torture is a really good example of the same problem. It's the most extreme example. So I called up the guy who did all of, who ran the CIA's enhanced interrogation program um, in Iraq, who was just living in Florida. Um, I went to see him. We actually, I wouldn't say we became friends. We were, we, we were quite friendly. Over the, I went to his house repeatedly and I have hours of some of the most extraordinary videotape with this guy, or audio tape of this guy describing what it meant to, you know, to, uh, to torture, he wouldn't use the word torture, but that's what he was doing, um, interrogate um, under ex extreme physical duress some of the leading members of Al-Qaeda. Um, super interesting. And he's not a, he doesn't appear to be a monstrous person. Um, by the end, you're almost convinced, he can almost convince you that what he was doing was justified. Um, uh, anyway, I, I use a, anyway, I'll come back to the tape in a, of that in a moment. Um, another fascinating thing was uh, I discovered, what you discover when you do books like this is that most of the high profile public criminal cases that you think you know, you don't know because the journalists who are writing about them actually haven't read stuff they need to read. Um, well, because they're in a hurry, they're writing. But if you're writing a book, you're not in a hurry. So at one point I was reading the footnotes to some there was a post-mortem on the Madoff case. It's like this big. And at the end, there's footnotes, or end notes. So I was reading the end notes. And there's this extraordinary story about how the most profitable hedge fund in the world, years before Madoff was caught, was doing trades with Madoff. And they became convinced he was a crook. And so they have an email exchange, which is all captured. Later found, years later, they discovered it, in which they say, yeah, the guy, this is just not real, what he's doing. And then they say, well, what should we do? Because we have invested with him. And these are, but this is the world's greatest hedge fund. Everyone involved is like a genius. They've made billions of dollars. So they figured out that it's not on the up and up. And at the end, they, they're like, yeah, I think it's fine. <laughs> so, so you realize, Madoff got away with what he got away with for so long, not because people investing in, with him are stupid, to the contrary, the smartest people on Wall Street invested with him and managed to convince themselves that nothing was wrong in the end. Um, that's like, when you discover something like that in the footnotes, that's like really a sort of made by day. That's a fun, really fun story. Um, a couple of things, last thing, but then I'm happy to answer questions. Um, the, you heard very briefly about this audio book that I did. Um, at the time I started writing the book, I started doing my podcast. And so I had in the back of my mind the whole time that there should be some congruence between podcasting and the audiobook. And so from the very beginning, I, this is, we're getting into an area of Arcadian here, but there's a big difference between the quality of the tape that you get from a normal journalist's tape recorder and the kind of tape recorders that podcasters use. So I invested the extra hundred dollars <laughs> in the better in the better tape recorder computer. So I had got good quality tape from the beginning. And um, and that meant that when it came time to do the audiobook, I I felt, well why don't I just instead of reading the quote from the person, why don't I just use the tape? Right? Um, but then also more than that began to happen, the more I did my podcast, the more it changed the way I thought about how the book should be written. And so I've been enormously gratified to learn as I've done all of the uh, interviews, the extraordinary number of interviews I've done so far um, in the, over the last two days, uh, that a number of people have said to me, which is really interesting, that the book reads differently than my previous books. Um, it feels, 
like I'm much more that I'm feels more conversational and more direct in the way that a podcast is. And I think that is very much a function of how my attitude towards telling stories has changed as a result of um, doing revisionist history. Um, so my idea is so the, that the experience of listening to the audiobook is going to feel different than the experience of listening to a standard audiobook, not just because we have music and scoring and actual audio tape and archival tape and, you know, which makes it a lot more direct and emotional, but also because the book is written with that experience in mind. Um, and it's my great hope that uh, this book, a much larger proportion of the sales of this book will be uh, audiobook driven um, than before. But more than that, um, my gut is that the audiobook sales will not be substitutive. Is that a word? I think it is. Will not substitute for the sales of the physical book. They will be additive. That what it will do will be to bring in uh, a whole class of people who would not otherwise be buying books, but who are now accustomed to getting their entertainment through their ears. Um, that we will be able to hopefully, knock on wood, um, tap into that audience uh, with this book talking to strangers. Anyway, so that is my little spiel, and I would be happy to answer any questions if any of you have some. Yeah, there's so there, I, I sort of, the book is divided into three parts. Each part is about a different, uh, so if you think of a conversation between two people who don't know each other, one of the things that makes the conversation work is that the conversation, the two people find a common ground, some kind of equilibrium. So each section of the, of the three sections of the book is devoted to a different thing which disrupts the equilibrium, um, or at least conditions in some way the equilibrium. Um, so for example, one of the things I spend a lot of time on is the notion of transparency. So as human beings, we have the assumption, we carry around us the, with, with us the assumption that uh, somebody's internal emotional states are reasonably accurately displayed on their face and through their demeanor. Um, that turns out to be that idea, by the way, was propagated by psychologists for many, many years. Um, it is now uh, understood to be false. And the consequences of that are quite profound. And that is, that explains an awful lot of why interactions between strangers go awry. Because if I know you very well, I am aware of those instances when your emotional reactions are, when your emotion, when your feelings are at odds with your demeanor. I know you as someone who, you know, grimaces when you are happy or is strangely calm in moments of stress. If, however, you are a stranger to me, then I'm much more apt to draw an erroneous conclusion from your from that discrepancy. And that's the story of Amanda Knox. Right? If you read all if you read as many of the books as Amanda Knox on as I have <laughs> but believe me, it was like that is you know several weeks of my life I will never get back. Um, they're all about the same thing, which is about a man who didn't behave the way we thought a grieving person behaves, right? That's it's not because she's guilty; it's because she's just a little bit weird, right? And by the way, many of us are a little bit weird in our emotional responses. So think about that in the context of law enforcement: that if you, by virtue of the law enforcement philosophy, that you are following, are forcing police officers to make consequential decisions about civilians in a wide variety of circumstances over and over and over again with extraordinary frequency. And then you are opening the door to this kind of 
very common misunderstanding. Only now the stakes are enormous. So one of the things that goes awry with Sandra Bland is the cop thinks he's, she's dangerous. Right? He becomes very quickly convinced that she has a gun on her or she means to do him harm. She is the furthest thing from dangerous. But what to her is experienced as it, uh, distress is read by him as malice. Um, and in a, you know, and he misreads her in the way that all of us misread each other all the time. But the difference is he's a cop, and the consequences of that misreading are much more dramatic. Anyway, that's a, an example of the way in which these stories feed back into the, um, the paradigmatic example of Sandra Bland. Yeah, I tried. There are cer certain things that I avoid scrupulously in my writing um, because I believe them to be uh, uh, sufficiently and perhaps exhaustively and perhaps exhaustingly discussed elsewhere. Um, politics is one. Social media is another. Um, so I have. I don't believe the word social media appears in the book, and I'm very proud of that. Um, <laughs> people are more than welcome to draw conclusions from the bit, my book about social media. But um, I happen, to, in this I am a minority of one, happen to be of the opinion that 50 years from now, people will wonder what social media was and be intensely perplexed by the strange hold it seemed to have over society for a brief period in the 21st, early 21st century. Um, given that it appears to have, I mean, there was at least a brief window about 10 years ago when people were under the comforting uh, illusion, although it was still an illusion, that Twitter and Facebook were useful in some broader social way. They were, remember when Arab Spring was thought to be something that was the, you know, this chance we have to overthrow the authoritarian regimes of the Middle East and install happy democracy can be accomplished through the engine of Facebook and Twitter. I mean, an absurd notion in retrospect, which nonetheless was held deeply by many thoughtful people in America for a brief period of time, and around the world for a brief period of time. You know, that's now been dispelled. Dispelled. So we're now left with, if you had to describe in two sentences or less, what was the positive social function of Twitter, what would it be? I don't know. Um, a source of amusement from time to time. Um, generally speaking, I don't think things persist in society in the absence of any compelling purpose. And I think we're fast approaching. Um, and in the presence of actual um, malignant consequences, I think we're fast approaching the point where we're going to give up on these, I think, perhaps. Like I said, I'm the only, I think I'm the only person who thinks this. But I would be very surprised if Twitter in its present form exists in 10 years. Any other thoughts? Sure. I'm sorry, I can't hear you. Oh, uh, well, uh, can't actually. So let me back up. I, um, uh, I, uh, one way to describe some of my books is that they are self-help books, except that they, 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 they lack the essential ingredient of the self-help book, which is they don't actually have a tidy conclusion at the end. So I have, I give you all of the pain of the self-help book without any of the joy. Um, but uh, the, uh, the short answer is you can only safeguard against misreading strangers by declining to read strangers or to reading stranger, read strangers with great caution um, and to limit your, forcibly limit your, um, uh, your, the circumstances under which you are required to read them. So here's one, I, the example I always give is I've become increasingly convinced that hiring, the hiring process is, which is a paradigmatic example of how you can misread strangers, is totally screwed up. Um, so I started a couple years ago. I hire an assistant from time to time. The first thing I did was, well, let's remove, let's make them redact their, the names of their educational institutions from their resume. So that was, because I realized it's not useful to know whether they went to X or Y. But the opportunity for 
mischief on my part is great if I know that fact. And then step two is, well, why am I meeting them exactly? So what useful, so the things I need in an assistant are, you know, uh, scrupulousness, conscientiousness, some degree of intelligence. Uh, they must be pleasant, at least, although that's not terribly important. Um, and they must be responsive to my emails at all hours. Um, can I usefully predict any of those things from a half an hour interview? No. So why have the half an hour interview? What does a half an hour interview do? Well, it inclines me towards people who I find amusing, interesting, or attractive. <laughs> do you need to be amusing, interesting, or attractive to be my assistant? Actually, no. <laughs> it is completely irrelevant. Um, what is the extent to which being amusing, interesting, and attractive is a useful proxy for being conscientious, diligent, and willing to answer my emails at all hours? I would say probably zero. So why am I doing it, right? So uh, I tried, so it, now it's very difficult not to meet the person who you want to hire because they want to meet you, right? So I wasn't, I just hired, I'm just hiring an assistant, but the one, the person who I, gave the job to, I didn't meet in person. I Skyped. Now, I that's cheating. But I would, next time I'm going to do only phone. Because I think even Skyping was a bridge too far. Um, <laughs> but I don't know, like I said, I don't know whether they'll, but interesting enough, I offered the job to her yesterday and she's still thinking about it. So <laughs> <laughs> maybe she's like, I'm not going to work for this dude, I haven't met him. So I didn't, that might be the, Because I wonder, 
Because normally, I would have not worked with children because I would be, I would have had control over them. But in this one instance where someone is forced on me, I realized I was not just wrong, but catastrophically wrong about them. Um, so now that just makes you, you know, that throws virtually every meaning, meaningful relationship in your life into <laughs> sharp relief. <laughs> so, so the short answer is yes.